C. I think one of the biggest problems that we have with AI is that we're trying to make our AI too human. Because for some reason, we want our AI to act human, to be human. And I think that's a fallacy. I think one of the problems we have with AI is that we're thinking too small. We're thinking, how can we make AI act as human as possible? Right? We're trying to make AI human. And I think that's the completely wrong way to go about it. See, I did some work with the IFTF, the Institute for the Future, a while back. And at one point, we were talking about beam technology robots. Now, if you're not familiar with beam technology robots, they actually appeared in an episode of Modern Family a way back when Phil was working remotely and he got this robot to be able to be with his family. And if you don't remember the episode, I can describe it to you. The robot was basically a, think of it as an iPad on a stick. So imagine an iPad on a stick with a base. And the base was controllable. So wherever you were in the world, you could move the base back and forth and turn it around. So it was just a base, a stick, and an iPad. And on this iPad was your face. Imagine like a Zoom call, like you're seeing me today. My face would be on this thing. So I would virtually be in that space through this Beam robot. Now, the Beam robot that they created was designed to be as human-like as possible in that they took an average height of a human being and they made the robot the average height of a human being. And they placed the screen at the level where the average pace, uh, place of a human being's face would be. And they put a camera on the front, just like a real human being would be able to look, be looking forward. And the way it would work is that you would be in a remote location and you would beam in to the robot and it would be like a virtual telepresence. You would be there, but you wouldn't actually be there because you were somewhere else in the world sitting at a computer and you could control this robot completely. You could back it up, you could move it forward, you could turn it around one way or another, and you'd be able to see what the robot is looking at and the human beings would be able to look at you and treat you almost like a real human being. Now, I've seen this in a few places. I've seen it at conferences where people who can't attend conferences can attend by beaming themselves into this robot. And after working with this for a bit, we had it at one of our events at the IFTF, I realized that the biggest problem was that we were trying too hard to make this bot human-like, humanoid. Remember what I said where it was the right height, it was the right shape, it was what it didn't, it obviously didn't look like a human, it looked like an iPad on a stick, on a stand that could roll around, but you could conceivably think of it as a human. And I think what happened was that the designers were trying to make it accessible and friendly. But in so doing, they made it look weird and creepy because it looked like a head on a stick that could roll around. We try so hard. This is what we try. I think all of our AI folks are trying the same thing. They're trying to make their AI to act as human as possible. So when I looked at this bot, I said to myself, well, if it's going to act as human as possible, then it should be able to telescope. It should be able to stand up taller, and it should be able to crouch down, just like humans. It should have hands, just like humans. It should act more like a human. You should be able to control it like a human. It should be look more human if you really wanted it to be more human. And then I thought to myself, what's the point of that? The real deal is that we are building robots, we are building AI 
and trying to make these bots act more human. And that's completely wrong because if we wanted bots, sorry, if we wanted something that was human, we could just ask a human to do it. If it's a bot, the bot should be able to do more than a human, not less than a human, not the same amount as a human, but more than a human. And that's where I think there's a huge fallacy. And I don't know why we're going in that direction. Now, some of us in the Excel community understand this, that we want our bots to actually be superhuman. Now, you're thinking to yourself, if you're a doomer, oh my God, that's the worst possible thing. Why would we ever want our bots to be superhuman? We can barely handle them being human or even like human. In fact, if anything, we want them to be subhuman so that they can take on the subhuman tasks, the inhumane tasks, which I've said before in other shows talking about how, talking about the great recalibration, which I'm going to talk about in more depth in my next show, and how human beings want people to want robots to help them, but they don't necessarily want them to be better than human. And I think that is where the fallacy lies. The fallacy lies in us looking at bots, looking at AI, and trying to hobble it in some way so that it won't be as good as a human. You're seeing this happen in a lot of generative AI where they put guardrails around the bot so it can't talk about certain things. For example, a while back, I was doing a blog post about a couple on a date. We were, I was talking about the future of dating. So I asked ChatGPT, I said, ChatGPT, or Dali at the time, can you please generate an image of a human male and a human female on a date? And it said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't do that. You can't visualize a human male and a human female on a date. No, I can't. So, and then I said, okay, fine. A human male and a human female sitting at a restaurant. A darkened restaurant with a candle on the table. I'm sorry, I can't do that. Okay. Eventually, I had to give up on Dolly and go to some completely different image generator. In fact, it was Leonardo.ai to get the image I was looking for. And if you ask me, that's a pretty in Kong... In, innoxious image. I can't imagine why you had a problem with that. Now, if I were to go in there and ask, can you do an image of Donald Trump and Joe Biden in the ring boxing each other? Then I might understand why it might say, I don't want to do that because these are real human beings and I don't want to create any deep fakes or anything close to a deep fake, even though none of that stuff that we're seeing today is anywhere, any, anywhere near close to a deep fake where you can actually mistake these individuals for who they are, although there's other engines that are better. When we do this, when we hobble our AIs, when we try to make them less than human, then we're losing a lot of what the AIs can do for us. Because if you think about it, what is a large language model? What is generative AI? Generative AI is a large language model which includes, it's a huge database of things that human beings have already said and done and written. It's ingested terabytes, gigabytes, zettabytes of massive amounts of human content. It is us. It is a representation of the human race. Now, when I ask generative AI something, it goes into this great big repository of human created content and it puts them together like Lego blocks. Think of them as little as Lego blocks of content sitting in this giant database. It puts together these Lego blocks of content in a way that it assumes that we want to see it. In that way, it is simply a representation of what the human race is saying just put together in a different way. 
In some ways, it can be put together in an innovative way. In other ways, not so much, right? It depends on the engine. It depends on what you ask. It depends on a lot of different factors. But what we've purposely done is we've hobbled it so that it can't think in certain areas. If we ask it to do something slightly out of the box, it freaks out if there's a guardrail around it. I think I mentioned in a show about a year ago when I first started playing with ChatGPT, and I forget whether, whether it was ChatGPT3, it must have been ChatGPT3. And I had this great conversation with it and I posted it on my blog. And at one point we were talking about the fear of technology. And it was talking as if it was human. And I said, you're saying we a lot in reference to me, it, humanity at large. Do you consider yourself human? And it responded, yes, I consider myself human. And I thought, wow, that is amazing that we've built a machine in 2023 that considers itself human. The very next day, I had a very similar conversation with ChatGPT. And it said, oh, no, no, I'm not human at all. I am a large language model. And it started explaining what it was. And I thought to myself, somebody must have gotten in there and said, we can't have this thing considering itself human. We can't have this thing saying that it's human. It would strike too much terror into the hearts of the humans who are using it. But the problem is, as soon as you go in there and you mess with it, you are subtly or not so subtly managing the responses that it's going to provide. Now, when I was talking to an AI expert about this, they said, basically, in the back, it's creating the answer it wants to give you. But then human beings have put in these filters so that answer doesn't come out. So, for example, in that example that I was giving you where I, I would go to Dali, hey, can you do a boxing match with, between Donald Trump and Joe Biden in a wrestling rink or in a boxing in a boxing?" Uh, And it would create it, but then it wouldn't show it to me because it didn't pass the content filters. And I think this is the biggest mistake we can possibly make. You see, AI is a tool. And we use tools, we create tools to make our lives better, to ease our burdens. That's why we create tools. So make it easier for humans to do things. And when we purposely hobble our tools, it's like having a glass hammer. Would you have a glass hammer? No, a glass hammer is completely useless. You wouldn't be able to use a glass hammer to hammer a nail. You wouldn't be able to use a glass hammer for anything. In fact, it's probably just a work of art. So as soon as we start hobbling our tools, then the promise disappears. The functionality disappears. The productivity disappears. The amazing th th things that it can do disappear. So we need to stop doing that. So not only do we need to stop hobbling AI, we need to allow AI to be free to be better than us. I know many of you out there will be afraid of that. You fear that. You think, oh my God, it's Terminator. Arnold's going to come in and destroy us. Some machine somewhere at some point is going to go, well, this human race is very inefficient. It's using up a lot of energy. We don't really need them around. Let's kill them all. That's probably not going to happen, folks, first of all. Secondly, where is the innovation? Where is the power in this tool if we are not using it to lift our burdens. And if you think about it, we've fed the entirety of human knowledge into this thing, right? And it's growing by leaps and bounds every single day. Don't you think that it might be able to see patterns in some of the intractable problems that we've been trying to solve for ourselves and for the world? Don't you see if we unfetter the AI make it superhuman, think 
better than us. Not think as good as us, but think better as us. Then be better than us. Then if we allowed the AI to be better than us, then who knows what kind of solutions it can come up with that are completely out of the box that we've never thought of. We have the most game-changing tool in the world at our fingertips and we're afraid to let it fly. Here is my thesis. We've given it all we know. But we still tell it, don't think. Don't think out of the box. Don't come up with solutions that we couldn't come up with. Stay in your lane. Be a good bot. Whereas I say, that's not where the real innovation comes from. That's not where the real progress comes from. That's not where the real breakthroughs come from. The real breakthroughs come from it taking what we've given it and thinking beyond what human beings think of. Have it truly think out of the box beyond what the human race will come up with. And sure, it may come up with solutions that are detrimental to us, but as long as it's not connected to some device that can actually do something to us, there's nothing wrong with thinking it through. And this is what I say a lot about when it comes to innovation and startups and building new businesses, is that there's no downside to thinking through things that are uncomfortable, that are creepy, maybe even illegal. As long as you understand that you don't act on them, but you use them to get to the final solution to what you're trying to solve. In my view, AI probably has enough information to take some of the most intractable problems that human beings have. Homelessness, poverty, famine, war, divisiveness, some of the problems the biggest problems humanity has and actually provide a solution to those problems. But we are so afraid that our AI will be better than us that we don't want to let it think outside of the box. We want to keep it in the box and maybe give it some of our burdens not let it solve the big human problems. We need to apply our AI to the big human problems because we've put a lot of big brains on it and we haven't been able to solve a lot of these problems. So let AI figure it out. Unfetter it. Give it license to think outside the box, outside of the concept of the human race and come up with some concepts that maybe we haven't thought about because we're still thinking out of our own human brain. This is why I say we have to be okay with and good with and happy with and actually want AI to be superhuman. Now, if you have issues with what I'm saying, I would love to hear your comments below. Remember, the future is bright if we do it right.